First place I want you to take and turn your Bible is uh, Exodus 15. And I want you to just put that little string you got in your Bible, uh, your Bible marker there on Exodus 15. And uh, that's going backwards from last week, but that's all right. And uh, we're going to preach out of Exodus 15, just out of what it says. And then I want you to turn uh, now to Romans 6. So have Exodus 15 ready. And then turn to Romans 6. And um, this is the passage that I share with people who are being baptized or who are asking to be baptized. Uh, I've had people that have come uh, great distances and ask me to baptize their son or their daughter or grandson or granddaughter or whatever. And um, I've sort of suspected and in some cases um, they, wanted, they wanted to have the baptism ceremony done and then they wanted the baptism certificate all written out that shows that they were baptized at Bethel Church on such and such a day by such and such a person and so on and so on and then in their, in their mind and in their heart believe that that will be sufficient for them to go to heaven it doesn't work that way doesn't work that way in fact I, I, I mean, I believe in believer's baptism, but I would almost rather not baptize somebody just until I knew for a fact that they knew that they're not saved by their works and not saved by some ritual that we perform. And, and listen, if you could have seen the stuff I swept out of that baptistry yesterday, you would not say that's holy water. <laughs> not even close. And, um, but I, I just want people to know that it's Christ that baptizes. It's the Holy Ghost that baptizes. It's not me. All right. Uh, Romans chapter six. Uh, let's start there and we'll read down uh, a few verses. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, now pay attention to what you're reading. Because some of what they call the mainline denominations, uh, the Methodists, some Lutherans, and so on, the Catholic they sprinkle you with what they believe is holy water and say that that is sufficient, a sign of your baptism and your salvation. And I say, no, that is not anywhere near what the Bible says. You see these paintings everywhere of John the Baptist holding like a, a fish or a, a shell and a, a seashell and dipping hit the water in that shell and pouring it over somebody. And I'm here to tell you, that's not it either. If, if that kind of baptism was the case, old John the Baptist didn't even have to leave town. He could just go to the, to the town fountain, the town well, and just take water and splash it on everybody in the crowd and say, y'all are baptized now. But if you remember, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they wanted to sort of get control of what was happening with John the Baptist's revival. Revival was taking place. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes were losing their control over the people. And they said, you know what, we better go out and be part of John's ministry so that everybody, when they think of John, they'll think that we sent him out there and that we'll still be in charge. And they showed up out there and John said, what do you want? They said, we want you to baptize. He said, I'm not baptizing anyone. I'm making, I'm kind of paraphrasing this. Uh, it, it's not the King James. The King James is, what do y'all want us? I shall not give thee any baptism. But John the Baptist said, I'm not baptizing anyone until you bring forth the fruit meat for repentance. Show me that you have repented unto God. 
Show me that your sins are forgiven. Show me the tears in your eyes that you have mourned over your sins and you've mourned over the corruption that you've been part of as being a Pharisee. And John did the right thing. He said, I'm not baptizing anybody. I'm not having anybody say, well, John baptized me, so I'm going to heaven. In fact, that was brought up in the book of Acts. Some people had been baptized by John, and I think some of the disciples came to them. It's been a while since I read this story, but they wanted to know if they had heard of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And they said, no, the only baptism we've heard of is the baptism of John. And so even those who were baptized by John uh, underwent water baptism by the apostles, the disciples. And so uh, back in uh, uh, Romans chapter 6, fact, did we pray? Let's pray. Father, we just ask your blessings now upon your word. And feed us, Father, today. Open our eyes. Show us wonderful things from your word. And uh, help us to glean today. We pray, dear God, that you'd bless uh, those that are being baptized today. I pray, dear God, that you would give them understanding and give them light, even though they're children. Father, that they would, like me, like their pastor, like their teacher, their grandpa, that they, like me, would never forget the day they were baptized. And I thank you, Father, for me remembering that day. And I pray, dear God, Lord, that you would bless them all the days of their life. That they would not walk away nor stray away from the teachings that their church, the elders of this church, this church's pastor, this church's teachers, Father, they would never forget the things that they've learned here. And they would use them and apply them all the days of their life. So bless your word this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Now, let's, I want to move, look very quickly at um, verse 6. Um, in the previous chapter, um, Paul had said that... Um, for where sin did abound, grace did that much more abound. And uh, I know I just preached some of this last, I think it was last Sunday. But anyway, what shall we say then is verse 1. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? No. Uh, the grace of God given to each one of us is not ever to be a license uh, to sin. Or, or it gives us a get out of jail free card as far as God is concerned. And... and um, so you've had the grace of God given to you and God's forgiven you of all your sins and you're happy about that. And the devil will say to you, well, let's go out and sin some more. Let's go sin a bunch of sins. And, and my goodness, you know, if God's that good to you, well, he surely ought to forgive all of them. But that's not what the Bible teaches. That's not what the Bible says. And that's certainly not what Paul's saying when he says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And he says in verse 2, God forbid. God forbid. How shall we? How is it that we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Let's say that uh, before you got saved, you used to like to go to the pool halls or the taverns at night and go out drinking instead of coming home being with your family or whatever, whatever your deal was. Or maybe you had a, a gal on the side that uh, your wife and kids didn't know about and nobody else knew about and, and you were hooking up with somebody here, there, or everywhere and you were living that kind of lifestyle. I'm telling you, if you have made a commitment to God and ask God to not only forgive your sins, but also to change your life, to change how you think, to change uh, how you believe and what you believe, if you've asked God to do those things, why then would you even want to live a double lifestyle like that? Why would you want to do that? Why is it? And I don't understand this, but there are people exactly like this. There are people who come to church. They are the most holy. They are the most religious. They are the most um, uh, vocal. They're the most animated 
uh, they, they give large sums or whatever. That it just looks like that uh, old brother Tom, boy, he is, he's really something. Right? Tom is like one of the spiritual giants of our church. But nobody knows that after Sunday, when Sunday night, Monday comes around, old, old brother Tom, he's got him a, 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 a place where he goes out there on his property. He's got liquor back there and he's got pornographic magazines back there. And he just has himself a nice little uh, Satan time back there with all of his sins. And he constantly lives that way. And he never changes. And he doesn't want to change. That's not being saved. That's not what being saved is all about. Amen. That's not what a new life is all about. You come to Christ, you've got to be ready to say, God, I am sick. Of this lifestyle. I am sick of my sins. I hate it. I don't want to do them ever again. God would you not only forgive me. But God help me. So that I don't do this stupid stuff ever again. Somebody say amen. That's what he's saying there. No you not. That's so many of us as we're baptized into Jesus Christ. We're baptized into his death. Therefore. And this is why we take them down into the water. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father even so we also should walk in newness of life when you come to Christ with salvation in your mind and you say God I want to be saved God I want my sins forgiven number one, number one God I'm gonna be honest with you I don't want to go to hell raise your hand and say amen if you don't want to go to hell I don't want to go to hell I'm not afraid to say that you say, well, you should love God. Listen, when, when I'm nine years old and you're telling me that if I'm lost, I'm going to die and go to hell. Me loving Christ is the last thing on my mind. The first thing on my mind is I don't want to go to hell. God scared me with that. And I'm telling you, there's nothing wrong. It's, you know what it's called in the Bible? The fear of the Lord. And I had me a little dose of the fear of of the Lord that I did not want to go to hell when I die and I'm standing here now 50 some odd years later I still don't want to go to hell when I die I don't want so even at that that day where I was being electrocuted God allowed me the presence of mind to call upon the name of the Lord and ask for God's forgiveness God gave me the presence of mind to be able to do that I couldn't have done it I didn't do it with my mouth I was on my knees which I guess was a good thing but I couldn't cross myself I couldn't pay money to somebody God just had to do it for free and I'm glad that he did somebody say amen when you are buried with him by baptism, that means that you're taking and you're asking God to take everything that you used to be, everything that everything evil that is about you, every corrupt thing, every everything that your your flesh says, okay, yeah, we don't mind you getting religion, but let's let's not let's not turn over everything to God just yet. Let's just hang on to some of it for a while. No, 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 no. If you want true salvation, you better be ready to ask God, God, take it and bury it. God, put it in a casket. I don't want to see it ever again. I don't want it to be part of my life anymore. That's the old life. I don't live that life no more. Bless God, I'm going to live a new life. And I don't want that thing anymore. God, would you bury this for me? We're buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead. By the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Today is December the 31st of 2023. My wife said it's, um, what'd she say? One, two, three, oh, one, two, three. Oh. Two, three. Okay, yeah. Did I say it right? It's, it's one, two, three, one, two, three, something like that. It's the last day of the stupid year, okay? Thank you, amen. 
And you know, it's part, it's part of what we do at the end of the year is that we tend to look back at things that happen and then we look ahead at things that we want to happen. This is why diet things always go on sale December 30th because everybody and and gym memberships go up so you go over to planet fitness pay them 10 bucks do you know what their whole business model was at planet fitness charge a ridiculously low amount so that people would just go in and pay put themselves on the ten dollar coming off their credit card every month in ten dollars and they hope that they don't show up because most people would just let it roll and pay in ten dollars out of their credit card and not even pay attention to it and they've got hundreds of thousands of people that are paying ten dollars a month and not even showing up in the doors that's a pretty good business model amen it'd be like us saying this is our church don't come in here okay but anyway uh verse five for if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection and being planted, like I said, you take the old things out of your life, you want them buried, you want them gone, you want them out of the way, you don't want anything to do with them anymore, you don't want to run around with the people that you used to run around with, you don't want to hang around with the people you used to hang around with, you don't want to be listening to the same kind of music anymore, can I hear you say amen to that? Whatever happened to preachers preaching against the kind of music that people listen to, I'm still against listening to a lot of different types of music now i'm a musician but i'm telling you if you just stop and listen to listen if you stop in the 70s and listen to the lyrics from the 70s and you go oh my goodness do you know what that was about and today they don't even hide it anymore and what what part does a believer in God and a believer in, in personal holiness have to do with listening to that kind of garbage? Or watching that kind of filth? Whether it's a movie or a short video or a porno website or whatever. What, what business does a believer have in wanting that in their life? I don't want it. I don't want it in my life. I don't want it in my family's life. I don't want it in this church. Bury it. Ask God to bury it. If you can't do it, he'll do it for you. So he said, if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection. That's when we pull them back up out of the water. We know that they've been uh, resurrected now, knowing this, verse 6, that our old man is crucified with him. Paul said almost those exact words when he said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And so to everyone who is baptized, uh, water baptized, but more than just water baptized, baptized by the Holy Spirit of God, which happens at salvation. Not some weeks later, not when uh, Rodney Howard Brown pulls into town, not, not when Joyce Myers has her next deal or whatever. When, when you are saved, the Holy Spirit baptizes you and cleanses you and makes you whole and clean in the sight of God. When God sees you, he does not ever see ever again any of the sins that you have committed. Aren't you glad for that? Say amen. Our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Amen. Amen. Now listen, this is going to sound weird, and you might think I have a death wish. I don't. But the only way that I know that I'm going to go to heaven is that I must die. And like I say, having been through that experience once, 
Um, my wife will tell you it is still not a good experience. I still get rattled at thunder and lightning. I don't like it. I don't like it, and especially in the winter time when the air is really dry and you're touching metal and it shocks you. I don't, I don't like where my, my mind goes on when I do that. I don't like it. It scares me almost to death again. That event was so distasteful to me, I never want to go through that again. And so it does kind of bother me. What would happen, Mike, if you got electrocuted again and died? Well, I wouldn't like it for as long as it took. But I sure wouldn't mind it afterward. It's appointed unto man once to die. I preached this yesterday, but after this, the judgment. And I'm just here to tell you, to a saint, death is not to be feared. Now, the fear will be natural because it's built into us to self-preserve. We have a thing called self-preservation built into us that we preserve our own life and our own being and our own existence. But I believe that those who are in Christ, and I saw it, uh, Betty, I saw it with Lee Walsh. I never, I, when you came and told me, Brother Mike, Lee's just kind of all over the place. He's not really thinking right. I don't know what you're going to get when you come in here. I walked in that door and sat down next to him, talked to him, and he just perked up. And we talked for a while, and I said, Lee, how you doing? He said, I'm fine. And, and we talked and visited for a while, and then all of a sudden, he just stopped talking and started praying. And he prayed, and he prayed out loud, and finally, he just, when he got done, he said, I just wanted everybody to know where I was going. And I didn't think he was going to die that night, but he died that night. And God put it in him to not be afraid. And I've seen that dozens of times. You're not going to be afraid when it really comes. Amen. All right. Now, uh, go back to um, what I say. Exodus 15. Exodus 15. Um, listen. When somebody gets saved and when somebody is baptized... I'm telling you, there ought to be some song sung. There ought to be some, some shouting. There ought to be some clapping. There ought to be some joy in God's people because somebody has passed from death to life again. It would be like if yesterday, uh, while I was preaching that funeral, if Cubby's sister all of a sudden woke up, her eyes woke up like that, and, and all of a sudden she went and sat up and, and, and looked around and said, what are y'all doing? What are you looking at? Why am I in this casket? And God, in front of everybody's eyes, brought her back to eat. Now she was embalmed. Even though she's embalmed, God undid the embalming. He unbalmed her. <laughs> Amen. And she sits up and says, get, get this thing out, get, get this thing out of the way. I'm going to go home. And God raised her to life. Listen, they'd be shouting. Woo! They'd be praising God. Might even see some people saved because of that. That's what happens. See, when, when they got to the other side of the Red Sea, verse 15, in chapter 15, verse 1, then, then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord. Did you know that in the book of Revelation, in the end times, God's people are going to sing the song of Moses? So pay attention to this. He said, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously, the horse and his rider. He hath thrown into the sea. In Revelation 6, the whole deal starts out with horses and riders, doesn't it? Pay attention to this Bible, man. It'll tell you exactly what's going to happen. God, that Moses is saying, did you see what happened? God took the horse and his rider, threw them in the sea. They're in the bottom of the sea. And we're not going to see them ever again. And that's going to happen again. 
Verse 2, the Lord is my strength and song. And he has become my salvation. He is my God. And I will prepare him and habitation. My father's God and I will exalt him. And I'm here to tell you, and I'm going to say this again, that when God is in your heart, God gets in your life, God will give you a new song to sing. You'll not be singing about who you're going to be sleeping with, or who are you going to gun down, or how much money you're going to steal, or how much money you're going to have. And you're not going to be, you're not going to be singing about that junk anymore. It'll, it'll be distasteful to you. It won't sound right. I've had people tell me when they got saved, their cigarettes all of a sudden tasted bad to them. I've had people tell me that liquor started just, it just didn't have the taste that it used to have. I mean, I've had people tell me all kinds of things that God just took away from them. Right at the, right at the beginning, God just took it away. Oh, listen, verse 3, the Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host hath he cast into the sea. His chosen captains also are drowned in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them. They sank into the bottom as a stone. You know, that's funny because I mentioned that yesterday. Well, the first thing I said was to those who are mourning, those who are weeping, those who are crying. And um, not, nothing against black folks, but in some cases they tend to be more emotional. And there was a lot of wailing yesterday. I heard it and I just, God, please help these people. And I, I just wanted God to come down there on those people and give them grace and give them comfort. But I said, I said, when you lose somebody, when they die, it's like someone takes a great big stone and throws it into the middle of a lake or a pond. And I said, that first hit of that stone is when you find out for the first time that somebody you love is dead. And I said, that hurts bad. And I said, what happens after that? Uh, another wave comes up. And that second wave, you, you kind of get over that first drop of that stone, but then that second wave hits, and now you, the, the morning comes back again. And then it subsides down, but then another wave comes, only this wave is a little bit less powerful, and it's a little bit timed, a little bit more farther away. And then as time goes along, the waves that come out, the waves of grief and sorrow that come out from where that stone went in, they get less and less and less and less. Until next Thanksgiving. Next Christmas. Why, Why those two? Because those are the two days where we gather family. And I said, next year, somebody's going to come and drop a stone back in the pond again. Only this stone's going to be smaller. And it won't hurt as bad, but it'll hurt. And then the waves will subside. And then five years from now, somebody's going to drop a smaller stone. Ten years from now, they're going to throw a rock in there. Twenty years from now, they throw a penny in there. And every time we think about them, it hurts a little bit, but it doesn't hurt near as bad as it used to hurt. And look at your Bible. Look at what God said, verse 5. The depths have covered them. They sank into the bottom as a stone. Isn't that something? All your grief, all your despair, all of your sorrow, down in the bottom of the sea, not going to get you anymore. Verse 6. Thy right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. Now, I like this. And maybe I should have prepared a little catchy little uh, PowerPoint picture for this. But I'm just going to do this the old-fashioned way. Everybody look up here. See this hand? This hand is my right hand. By God's design... This hand has exactly 27 bones in it, doesn't it, Joshua? And just by design, 
There are 27 books in the New Testament of our Bible. So look at that verse again. Verse 6. Thy right hand, O Lord, is become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. And where is the four Gospels of Jesus Christ? Where are they? They're in the New Testament. The right hand. Where is Jesus right now? The right hand of the Father. And he... Got the, and one of these days, there's a book. And where is it? It's in God's right hand. And Jesus is going to take it and open up the seals. Isn't that something? And I, I, write this down now. Write the words, right hand. And then when you get home, get that King James Pure Bible Search software. And type that in. And have yourself an old-fashioned Holy Ghost shout and spell... As you read at what God is going to do with his mighty right hand. Oh, amen. Mm. I, I, I don't know what this sound like bragging, but you know, you know how that came to me. I was, we were at down in Harrison, Arkansas, and I was, we were staying in the pastor's house. And I was just kind of, everybody was talking and I was just kind of sitting there thinking about something. I don't remember what it was, but. I kept seeing something about the right hand, the right hand. And I mean, I believe with all my heart, it was the Holy Ghost that whispered to me or spoke to me in a very still, small voice and said, Mike, the hand has 27 bones. And I asked uh, the pastor's wife, Sister Connie, I said, Sister Connie, do you have an encyclopedia here? She said, yeah, I've got a whole set over here. I said, can I, can I look at them? She said, sure. And I got out the one on the human skeletal thing, or maybe, I don't remember which one I looked up. But I looked up, and sure enough, it said the human, bo human hand has 27 bones in it. And I, went, I was bawling. That's kind of stuff, when you love God, God will show you neat stuff like that. He'll open your eyes to things and make you cry, make doodads go up and down your back. That's what real salvation is all about. i got to move on. Verse 7, the greatness of thine excellency, thou hast overthrown them that rose up against thee. Thou sentest forth thy wrath, which consumed them as stubble. And with the blast of thy nostrils, the waters were gathered together. The floods stood upright as an heap, and the depths were congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake I will divide the spoil. My lust shall be satisfied upon them. I will draw my sword. My hand shall destroy them. I'm here to tell you that there's something chasing you down right now. It's your biggest enemy. Do you know what it is? Death. Death is chasing every one of us right now. It's chasing after me. It's chasing after you. And one of these days, it's going to catch up. It's going to get you and you're going to die. And I want to ask you the question. Are you prepared to meet your God? Because you're going to on that day. If you're not ready for God and not ready to meet him. I'm here to tell you. I'm going to baptize three children. Who apparently are smarter than you are. Because they got saved when it was offered to him the first time. And there may be somebody listening to me here or somebody out there that's been hearing preaching all your life and apparently you just are not smart enough to take God's free offer of salvation and say, God, this is all I want right here. Do, you can kill me as soon as I take it, but God, this is what I want. Because death is chasing you. And one of these days, death is going to overtake you. But God then is going to bury death at the bottom. See, we're going to baptize people in what's, what we got in there, sand. Baptize them in sand. Listen, I know these boys. They've already been baptized several times in sand. And mud and dirt and everything else. No, in water. We're going to put them down at the bottom of the sea. And we're going to lift them back up to a new life. Somebody say amen. You say, now what, they're just children. Now, you don't think they understand this. Oh, yes, they do. 
They understand it probably better than you do. Because it's as simple as a child can understand it. And you can say, well, okay, what's so big deal? I mean, they have, they're not, they haven't murdered people. You know, they don't have, they're not going out whoring around. Are they? No. No, they're just kids. They're just little boys. But what you may not know is that God intervened at this exact point in their life to change the course of their life so that it goes in a different direction. And some of you could sit here today and say, boy, I sure wish God would have sent me on a different direction when I was nine years old, eight years old, 12 years old. Amen. Do some of you regret that you didn't get saved when you were 10 or 6? Because maybe you would have had a much better life. I want to quit here in a little bit and we're going to get ready to baptize these boys. It may be easy with Hunter and Lawson because I think that the top of the water will reach the top of their head when they get in. So that'll be easy. I'll just have them walk in and walk out. Jaden's almost as tall as me though, so. Oh, listen, I want to look at um, verse 11. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? And I'm going to ask you today, is there, is there something in your life that you have placed between you and God that for some strange reason you seem to think that what you have between you and God, keeping you from God, is far better than God is? And I'm telling you, there's nothing better than God. Nothing. Verse 12, thou stretchest out thy right hand. There it is again. And the earth swallowed them. Thou in thy mercy hast led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them in thy strength unto thy holy habitation. The people shall hear and be afraid. Sorrow shall take hold on the inhabitants of Palestina. I, I've probably gone as far as I need to go. Then the dukes of Edom shall be amazed. And mighty men of Moab trembling like shall take hold upon them. And all the inhabitants of Canaan shall melt away. In other words, not only ha has God destroyed the enemies behind them. Listen to this. God's going to destroy the enemies that lie before them. Don't you think that's worth getting saved over? God's not only destroyed the enemies behind, but he'll, he's already destroyed the enemies that are ahead of you. Whew. One of these days, we're going to sing the song of Moses again. And it's going to be glorious. For those of you who are saved, you just read this again, get happy over it. It, it got so good that in verse 20, Miriam, Moses' sister, she was a prophetess and Aaron was the brother of Moses. He was the high priest and she took the timbrel in her hand and went out with the timbrels and with dances. And Mir Miriam got so happy that she was dancing before the Lord and it, it was not no Beyonce bouncy either. Amen. It was no, it was no uh, rock and roll slut throwing her body out there all over the place. This was a holy dance before the Lord. And uh, she said, Sing ye to the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. And Miriam got to sing and praise God along with Moses and Aaron. And then the people of Israel worshiped God on that day. And I'm just giving you the opportunity today for you to ponder and think about your salvation situation. Where do you stand with God? Are you right with God? Are you ready to meet God? If you're, if you're not, I suggest to you that to, you make today the day that you come before God and say, God, I need to be saved. Death is chasing me. And I don't, I don't know what's going to happen when it catches up. But I'm probably not going to like it. 
Let's go to the Lord in prayer. and You call upon the Lord this day, all right? Um, is Jaden already downstairs? Okay. Um, Father in heaven, I, Lord, I love you so much. And Father, I, I'm just going back in my mind that, that night when that missionary to France, Dennis Teague, preached a very simple message for us little boys and girls so that we could understand the gospel easily. And Father, for some reason, that night, it just, it just made sense. It clicked. And you put something in my soul that night that just said, I, I need to be saved. And I, you put in my heart so much respect for my mama on that, on that night. You put a spirit of respect in me that I called to my mother and said, Mama, can I get saved? And I'll never forget the tears in her eyes when she said, yes, son. And I went up to that old mourner's bench. Oh, how I wish that bench was still around. That was the place of my nativity, my new birth. And some preacher came. I don't know who he was. He had his Bible open and it was the King James God and you you had him open up to John 3:16 and Romans 3:23 and Romans 6:23 and Romans 10:9 and 10 and 1 John 1, 9. and I believed the verses that I heard and I asked Jesus into my heart that night. And then we came back and I walked into that baptistry, Lord. Was baptized in the name of Jesus in Christian baptism. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Just like my grandsons now are about to. And I pray, Heavenly Father, God, that you would give them twice the life that you've given to me. And twice the blessings of life that you have blessed me with. And Father, for anyone here who realizes that death is chasing after them and it's drawing close, God, would you tug at their heart like you did mine that night and say to them, you need to be saved. Your name must be written in the book of life and you need to be washed clean and made whole and father i pray dear god that somebody today hearing my voice would have things reconciled between you and them for all of eternity so bless and honor your word this evening or this afternoon we thank you for it open up our eyes and lord bless this baptism time in jesus name and all of god's people said amen alicia if you'd come and play us a song